Hey, everybody. Welcome to I-80 Sports. We're going to be here talking about college football top 10. Let's get into it. Hope everybody's having a good night. Thanks again for joining us here at I-80 Sports College Football. Today we're taking a little different turn. The season's right around the corner here. We're going to go over our top 10 at the start of the season where we have our teams ranked. Um, and we're just going to get right into it here. We'll, we're, we'll count down from 10 as we go through. We'll talk about a couple teams, give you our input, see, give you some reasons why we like these teams, some players to look out for. And we'll have a lot of fun. So once again, thanks, everybody, for joining us here at I-80 Sports. And uh, we'll just get right into it. It's Rich here with Ed and Dave. Um, yes, sir. Let's go. Let's uh, let's start off here with uh, 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 maybe someone, maybe a team we might not see in the top 10. Let's go to Ed. Let's go to your number 10 team here in Oregon. Why do you have Oregon here at number 10? I, I have Oregon at 10 because, yeah, listen, they had a lot of guys opt out last year. And with the returning talent, the offense is supposed to be better than the 413 yards and 31 points a game that they averaged last year. So a lot of it, I think, is going to depend on the uh, transfer from Boston College, Anthony Brown. If he, it's his job to lose. If he can perform well, they could e they could even finish higher than 10, in, in my opinion. Uh, their defense is going to be solid. Uh, they're going to be led by Kayvon Theodo. Uh, he's going to, he's a future first round pick from the ducks. Uh, they play a three, four defense. He'll play a little outside linebacker. They'll put him uh, as their end to rush as well. He'll lead the way. So with this, with the stout defense that they have there in the pack 12, and if this kid, Anthony Brown from BC can play, I think Oregon's got potential to actually finish. I'm going to start him at 10, but they have a good shot at finishing higher than that. So you're saying top 10 all the way for Oregon here. Let's go over to Dave and get his number 10 team, which could be a surprise to a lot of people. It's it's Coastal Carolina, and uh, they were a surprise last year. And I, they get their quarterback coming back, the Grayson McCall. And so I think, um, you know, and again, they don't have like the toughest schedule in the world being in the um, – they're, they're in the uh, – they're in the Sun Belt, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, – so I really think that they, they can uh, possibly go, you know, maybe undefeated, or lose one game. And I think I think they'll sneak into the top 10. And uh, like I said, but I, I'm not the type of person who goes chalk. I like chaos. So the more uh, teams that are in the top 10 that you don't expect, it's better, I think. Yeah, going speaking top 10, all three of us, we're expecting a little chaos here at the bottom of the top 10. I'm going to have another team here in my top 10. I'm going to go with USC. That's Southern California. So USC won its first five games last season. They lost only one game last year. Again, it was a shortened season for the Pac-12. They lost to Oregon in the Pac-12 title game. And that was the only game they didn't score 28 points. So I think they're going to have a really dynamic offense with quarterback Keaton Slovis coming back. They have wide receiver Drake London, who's, who's going to be strong. And they have a Texas transfer, Keontae Ingram, as their running back. So um, he, was, he was very potent at Texas last year in his limited time. And... Uh, I think he's in line for a big role here at running back for USC. So they have some threats on offense and they're returning eight starters on defense. So I think there's a real path for them to be six and zero when they head to Notre Dame in October. I, I think that'll be a, a, a key game in their schedule when they visit Notre Dame. But I think USC has a chance to be in the top 10 here. Keaton Slovis will be playing the NFL and they have yeah. some dynamic other skill players. So and to piggyback off of that, Rich, I, I would probably have them at 11 uh, I'm close to the Oregon USC, but I agree with what you said. I think what we'll find out is uh, everybody's top five seems to be the big five powerhouses. And then six through 10 is kind of like rolling the dice. That kind of shows you the disparity between the top dogs and everybody else. So it'd be interesting to see how ours plays out uh, compared to what the experts or so-called experts have. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of, uh, that six through 10 range, we actually all have someone different at our number nine spot also. So let's go to Ed here. And why do you have North Carolina at number nine? Why is North Carolina there? Yeah, I have the Tar Heels at nine. Uh, and Sam, we trust, man. He is He's one heck of a quarterback. I really like him. Uh, has the potential to be the first draft pick, number one draft pick this year coming off the board. But as I said, it's going to be all about in Sam, we trust. Because the offense... Um, 
he needs to replace all, all of his skill guys uh, went to the NFL this year. Deami Brown, Daz Newsome, Michael Carter, Javonta Williams, both running backs, both receivers, all to the NFL. Uh, the good news is all five offensive linemen returned. So that's going to help. They have a Tennessee transfer running back, uh, Ty Chandler, who should help in the backfield. So uh, it's going to be a lot of weight on Sam's shoulders. It would have been nice if a couple of those kids kind of stuck around for him. I think they'd had a shot to make a run at uh, Clemson if everyone stayed that could have stayed. Um, defense brings back quite a bit, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. That defense wasn't really too much to write home about last year. So they got in some improvement. I really just have him at nine because of Sam Howell. I think he's a great leader, great player. Uh, and I'm, I think he's going to bring out the best out of what he's got there. But th this is a team that can very easily – finish outside the top 15 if, if things don't roll their way and Sam doesn't get. But with five offensive linemen returning, I, I still think it's they're a solid squad. Yeah, for sure. The offensive line, that's where it's going to start for, for North Carolina. I just think they're them losing all their skill guys to the NFL is going to hurt. We'll see what Sam Howell really has this year when he doesn't have all those NFL guys on his team. So let's go to my number nine here. This is kind of a surprising pick as well. I'm going to go with Wisconsin. So in 2020, the Badgers had a ton of COVID-19 issues, and now they've had a full offseason with quarterback Graham Mertz. I think he's the most talented quarterback they've had there since Russell Wilson. Um, they haven't really had the greatest crew there, so that's not much to say, but I think Graham Mertz is going to be a solid player for them. He showed a lot of potential last year. He struggled at times, but I think the Badgers are definitely the favorite in the Big Ten West, where they would meet Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship. Um Ohio State's the cream of that division, but I think Wisconsin's got enough here. They got uh, Jalen Berger is their new running back there, so they're looking to him to be a big-time running back for them. So I like Wisconsin here at number nine. Nobody else has Wisconsin in their top ten here. What week do um, they play Notre Dame? I'm trying to get that pulled up here. That's going to be a very um, interesting game for them. That I think that's going to determine their season right there. I'm not too high on Notre Dame this year. I don't have Notre Dame in my top ten. I think Notre Dame's down for some – or is, is, is due for some regression. I agree. Uh, let's, let's go over here to Dave and his number nine pick. And this is going to surprise some people because both myself and Ed have this team a lot higher is Georgia. Why do you have Georgia at nine, Dave? You're muted. Sorry. Um, it's hard when the first game of the year is um, Clemson, you know, it, it just, it just, it's you, you're behind the eight ball the rest of the year and you're trying to play catch up and, they, and they're a little banged up now. And so I, I think that that's the only reason I think, um, you know, and they got, they got Florida on their schedule. I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a shame that, that they start the season with Clemson. Um, you know, uh, other than that though, I mean, you're right. They, they're a top five team, um, but it's just so hard because when you lose the first game, especially, to a really good team, it just but you have to be perfect the rest of the year, and I and I don't think Georgia's a perfect team, so they'll probably trip up again along the way. So probably so they'll play in the Blues in like two or three games and finish, you know, just like around top ten. Yeah, so um, both myself and Ed have the, have Georgia a little higher. I have them at number five. Ed has them at number four. I just think they have a good defense. Their defense is always good. They have Nicobe Dean back, Lewis Seen back, and pass rusher Adam Anderson. He's going to have a bigger role. And they had a couple big transfers. They got Tyke Smith from West Virginia and Darion Kendrick from Clemson. They're going to help out with that secondary there at Georgia. And they've given up fewer than five yards per play in four consecutive seasons. So we know Georgia's defense is always going to be solid. The biggest question for Georgia, which is which makes sense why you have them down here at nine, is the passing offense. Is it going to be as explosive as it was at the end of the season? I'm a believer in JT Daniels. That's why I have him in my top five here. I like JT Daniels. I think he's a star, and I think if, if he proves what he, what I think he can prove, they could even compete for the top team in the country. A lot of people are saying they could even compete for a national championship with that team. Their yeah. offensive line has three starters back, and running back Zamir White and James Cook are definitely dynamic players that we'll look to see uh, have some success here at Georgia. What do you think about Georgia, Ed? Yeah, I have I'm, I'm a number four, and just uh, once again, jumping on what you said, a lot of people have them uh, right now are saying they're – well, I can't say they're saying it right now because there have been some injuries, but
But before the injuries hit, a lot of people said they were this was their year. If they were going to win it, this would be the year for them to win it with the quarterback, uh, the receivers that they have, which a lot of them are banged up, and their yeah, defense, Pickens, especially Pickens. Yeah, Pickens, is a big one. and then they had the transfer, the transfer that was a tight end that was going to be tight end, but they were also going to split him out wide. Um, he was pretty good as well, and he's banged up as well. So uh, it's just if they can get by the injuries, the schedules play out well. Uh, I'm going to let you guys finish. Hold on. Sorry about this. I got a dog I got to let out. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> no problem there. Uh, let's let's get into our number eight teams here. So, again, at eight, we all have a different team. Mine, mine might be a little lower than some others, but um, Dave, wh- um, why do you have Oregon here at number eight? Did you mention well, Oregon before? Yeah, but well, pretty much like well, Ed had him in what, number 10, right? Oregon? Um, yeah, Oregon. I had a ten. Yeah, and I, I mean, I really like to transfer Anthony Brown from Boston College. He's gonna, he's going to be in a quarterback friendly offense, and you know, having a lot of players return from the COVID uh, from last year, and I don't and the Pac twelve other than USC, I don't see too many teams really playing that well. So I think um, I think Oregon was going to be have a good chance to win the Pac twelve championship again and uh, be a top ten team. Absolutely. So see here, number eight for me, I have Texas A&M. Uh, they're a little lower than a lot of people have them because I think the loss of Kellen Mond, although I, I wasn't a huge Mond guy, I think that's going to be uh, – he was their longtime starter there. They have two guys competing, Haynes King and Zach Calzada, are competing to replace him. Their big thing is their dynamic running back core. They have three absolute studs. They have Isaiah Spiller, Anaya Smith, and Devon Ashane. Those three guys are probably the best running backs in the country this year as a tandem. I think those three guys are going to need to be leaned on. But the one thing from last year, their offensive line needs to replace four starters. Um, The Maroon Goons from last year. I love that nickname. That that was the nickname of that unit, the Maroon Goons, the Texas A&M offensive line. They're going to have to replace some of those goons this year. They're going to need four new guys. They do have some highly touted recruits in line to take over. But, uh, again, offensive line can take a little time to gel. They do have nine starters back on defense, and they aim to allow fewer than 100 rushing yards per game for the third season and for the third time in four seasons. Now, their season is on October 9th. They play Alabama at College Station. They win that game. The whole thing's all flipped upside down. So that's the big one, October 9th against Alabama. Anybody else want to discuss Texas A&M and where they have them? I, I have them. Then. You threw it out there. I'll jump ahead. I have Texas A&M at six. Uh, I like Haynes King. Don't know if he's going to win the job. I do agree with you. Uh, Kellen Mond was ba- he's probably better than advertised. They didn't get a lot of credit, but he did a mm-hmm. nice job there. Uh, going right into your wheelhouse, like you said, losing four offensive linemen is going to hurt. But if they can get some guys that can make some blocks, they I, just like you said, they're running backfield, their depth is great spiller a chain and then the the running back wide receiver combo with uh smith who can go pretty much anywhere kind of like a swiss army knife mm-hmm. offensively they're good the thing that a lot of people don't talk about uh they they have a solid defense as well they're probably gonna have one of the best defenses in the sec to go along with alabama and georgia when georgia gets healthy so i think their defense is going to carry them uh in the beginning uh, i'm looking forward to when they play alabama i hope everybody's healthy and we see a good game, but I'm a Jimbo Fisher guy. Uh, Jimbo Fisher guy as well. wasn't too big of a fan at Florida State, but what he's doing at Texas A&M, um, uh, I, I kind of like it. He's recruiting well, bringing the right guys in there, and uh, I, I'm expecting them to have a nice season. Follow up off of last year, I got him at number six. Texas A&M. Um, Ed, you have this team here at, at eight. My, both myself and Dave have them at number seven, which is Cincinnati. Let's talk a little bit about Cincinnati. Go ahead, Ed. Tell us about Cincinnati here. I, I have them at eight. I, I debated putting them at seven, but I just I left them at eight because they're going to have to prove themselves a little bit this year. Uh, the defense was fantastic and should be close to the same killer unit again this year. Uh, they allowed an average of 17 points a game last season. Very, very solid defense. Coach well defensively. I expect a real nice thing from defensively this year. Offense brings back a lot, but they need to replace both offensive tackles, which could cause the returning quarterback Ritter some fits until those guys get established. Replacing both tackles, 
it's going to be a little tough for them. Uh, also, they put Indiana and Notre Dame on the schedule this year. So I know Richie said you're not high on Notre Dame. I'll be honest with you. I'm not that high on them either, but still adding Notre Dame and Indiana, who's not going to be no pushover either on the schedule. They can get by Indiana and go into Notre Dame game undefeated and then somehow, you know, knock off Notre Dame. You're probably going to see them in the top five, top three, maybe. So there's big potential there, but there's a couple questions. Offensive tackles for sure. And uh, they need a little more running, uh, another running back as well. Dave, what are your thoughts on Cincinnati? Okay, sorry about that. Um, Yeah, um, okay. I think the the biggest key for them is the Notre Dame game because their defensive coordinator actually went to Notre Dame. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see how he knows how to handle the Cincinnati offense. Um, And, uh, but I think, again, if they can get through Notre Dame, the the schedule is out there for them to make a run. But they they just were almost undefeated last year. And, uh, they, you know, and they get, like I said, their defense is going to be pretty good again, and they got the quarterback returning. And that's my big theme in the top ten is um, that uh, the, a lot of the teams that have quarterbacks returning versus teams that don't. Um, I, I think I think it's huge to have you know quarterbacks, especially still with COVID. I know they've had like normal practices close to it this year, but still, it's not a hundred percent back. And so I think I think if you look at last year, Oklahoma struggled in the beginning with their quarterback. Um, I, I think uh, so. I think. Having a quarterback returning is huge this year. I think that's a huge advantage for Cincinnati. Yeah, I'm a big <laughs> believer in quarterbacks returning production from the whole team, really, returning starters, and the schedule. So you guys both mentioned the schedule for Cincinnati. They really cruised through the American last year. They almost upset Georgia in the Peach Bowl. Uh, they had a, that undefeated regular season. They were only at number eight, and that's due to their strength of schedule. It wasn't very strong. You guys both mentioned them adding Indiana and Notre Dame. I think that's going to give them a much better chance to rise up the rankings. And Desmond Ritter, obviously a quarterback. Uh, I think he's definitely going to be an NFL quarterback. And they have one All-American potential cornerback, Sauce Gardner. So watch out for him on the defensive side of the ball for Cincinnati here. So that was my number number eight or my number seven, Ed's number eight, and Dave's number eight. So let's get into here with our other number seven team with Ed's Iowa State, Iowa State Cyclones. I have the Cyclones at seven. Uh, I remember if you look back, guys, on some of the shows, people watching, feel free to go back to last year. Last year, I said, was Iowa State year. I thought Iowa State had the chance to have a special season last year, and they they performed well. Uh, Obviously came up short against Oklahoma, but I thought that was this year. But you know what? This year, Coach Campbell. Brock Purdy, Breesy Hall are all back. Uh, This lines up to be a very special season for them as well. They're very solid offensively. Uh, Tight end Kotler is a stud. He's going to be definitely an NFL player. Uh, I think September 11th, when they play Iowa, that's getting a lot of notice. I've started to see Iowa pop up in a lot of top 15. Some people have them in the top 10. That's going to be a good – that's going to be the measuring stick for Iowa State. If they can get back by Iowa – I think it sets up schedule sets up pretty well for them in Oklahoma to battle at the end of the season and uh, see what happens. So I got Iowa State at seven. I, um, I, I'm going to wait and see what they do with Iowa. And then uh, they beat Iowa. I was a little higher on them this year, be, uh, last year, excuse me, uh, because I wasn't as high as on uh, Oklahoma as I am this year. But uh, I have them at seven. Iowa State at seven. Yeah, I have, a, I have a Iowa State here at number six. I think Matt Campbell is doing an excellent job. Great coach. Um, Great coach. Before he got there, they were lucky to get to a bowl game. Now they're nipping on Oklahoma's heels in the Big 12. So they can push Oklahoma there. They've been pushing Oklahoma. Uh, the Cyclones have their sets, their sights set much higher here. They're returning 20 starters out of the 22 on both sides of the ball, which is absolutely huge for returning production standpoint. If they can beat Oklahoma, they might be a possibility for the college football playoff. You said Iowa. That's another tough game for them. They're returning quarterback bright. Uh, Brock Purdy, running back Brees Hall, tight end Charlie Kohler, wide receiver Will McDonald, who I think is a very solid player, and they have a great DB in Greg Eisworth. I think they're all among the best position players in the Big 12 at their respective positions, and they have a ton of experience. 
the one thing, can they handle the pressure of being the favorite rather than the underdog? They've always been the underdog in the past. How's that going to affect them this year? We'll see. Yeah, he's definitely Coach Campbell is he's he's fantastic. He's got the whole the whole camp is buying into that program and and they, they definitely feed off of him. And I'm looking forward to some exciting stuff from them, but I still only have him at seven. Dave's got him a little higher than both of us at number four. What are the reasons you have Iowa State here at number four, Dave? Well, to, to like uh, kind of pile on what you guys said with uh, Brock Purdy coming back, and also I think Charlie uh, Kohler, the tight end, um, he's going to be. He's, you know, last year I liked um, Kyle Pitts. This year, Charlie Kohler, Charlie Kohler is my guy. I think he's going to be a beast in the NFL, and I think uh, and I and also I think Ames is becoming a tough place to play uh, going into uh, Ames, Iowa. And so I, I think that um, if, if, they, if they could beat Iowa, because I, I just have Iowa just outside my top 10. I would probably have them at 11 or 12. So that's going to be a tough test. And um, if they could beat them, uh, you know, look at the rest of the Big 12. I mean, it could, it's going to come down to, I think, Iowa State, Oklahoma. And it's, if Oklahoma runs the table and then Iowa State can beat Oklahoma, it's possible you could have two Big 12 teams in the uh, college football playoff. Absolutely. I'm, uh, we're all on board here with Iowa State. Now let's get into our number six here, Dave. You have this team at number six in Ohio State. I have them a little higher at number three. Ed's got them right here at number five, and that is Ohio State out of the Big Ten here. So let's get into Ohio uh, Iowa State. I keep messing these up. Ohio <laughs> State, the four-letter words in that, uh, in that conference are getting me. So let's go to Ohio State and Ed. Tell us about Ohio State. Uh, who, who's the quarterback? You know, they, they say it's Stroud's job to lose. It, you know, Justin Fields is, is definitely not going to be easy uh, to replace. That That's for sure. Um, plus, they open the season at Minnesota. Then they have Oregon. So that's not easy either. Uh, I'll tell you, they got two great receivers, and uh, Alave and Wilson. Uh, so that's going to help. I think this Travion Henderson is going to be the next stud running back to come out of Ohio State. So that's good. But I'm also not sold on their defense. They've lost some defensive guys. I wasn't really sold on them last year. Although, I mean, what they did to Clemson was embarrassing. But I'm still not hooked on their defense at all. That's why I have them at five. I think a lot of people have them inside their top three. Uh, Ohio State, I've seen at three quite a bit. But I, I have them at five. I think they got a tough schedule, and I don't think they're settled that quarterback yet. It's that kid's job to lose, but they, they have the high school kid there too. I, I can't pull his name off the top of my head yet, but he started practicing. Uh, he, he's got a chance to push for it, but until they establish a quarterback, uh, I, I have him at five. Dave, what are your thoughts on Ohio State? Yeah, I think um, that's that's the biggest issue with Ohio State's the quarterback position with the fields gone. Um, if they, uh, you know, they definitely have a uh, one of the top offensive lines in the country. Their skill players are good, or well, well, really better than good. You know, they're great. So I think that the toughest thing is the quarterback play. If they, I would have probably have them in the top three if it wasn't, you know, if the quarterback was a known quantity. Um, so right now, that's the biggest issue with Ohio State. Otherwise, I mean, offensively, like you said, their line and their skill players. And, you know, and I think the, their defense could is decent enough where I think, you know, if they get any kind of good quarterback play, they definitely could push the top three. But I just think that, that they're, they're going to be um, – the fans are going to be disappointed because the level of play from fields is going to go down from last year, and that's going to cost them to lose a couple of games. I just think the, the – me talking about Ohio State, why I have them at number three here, I just think the gap between them and the rest of the Big Ten is really large. Uh, they won four straight conference titles with Ryan Day. They have an excellent roster under Urban Mine under Urban Meyer, and Day's continued that. The two question marks they have is that quarterback C.J. Stroud is going to lead them, I think, coming out out the gates here. And they have a very young secondary. They struggled defending the pass last year in 2020, but they always seem to develop these top level cornerbacks. So they, there's coaching. There's good coaching there at the DB level. So um, there's really not many QBs in the Big Ten that, that really scare me either. So um, those were the those are the two weaknesses, but I think their wide receiver core is the best in the nation. They have two first-round picks, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. They're definitely potential first-rounders in the draft next year. And they have other guys too. They have Jackson Smith and Jigba, Julian Fleming, Marvin Harrison Jr. 
and Mika Ekbuka. They're all going to see the field and rotation. They got really five guys there, and I think the present and future of this group is extremely high, and I think their receivers are definitely the strength of that team. I think they have the best receiving core in the nation this year, no. and that's definitely going to help out uh, CJ. <laughs> Who's got the best receivers in the nation? I would say – <laughs> no, you know what? I'd like Clemson's going to be Clemson's going to be okay. They got a couple. They're going to be better than okay. If Justin Ross plays this year. EJ Williams. Um, uh, they have two freshmen, Bo Collins as a freshman, Dakari Carter. I mean, Clemson's good. I'll get. I'll give Ohio State over Clemson. But when we get to my number one team in the country, they have the best wide receiver uh, room in the country for sure. And we'll All save right. that till we get to them. But I would take my number one team's wide receiver crew over Ohio State. No, hey, I'll give Ohio State second, but you know Alabama's got a good one too. Now this is a surprise team here in the top ten. Neither myself or Ed have this team in here. Dave has Miami sitting here at number five. I Why think is Miami number I think, five here? I think Dave spelled Pittsburgh wrong and typed <laughs> Miami instead of Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, I think I think it all depends on the health of uh, King, the quarterback, coming off the uh, ACL. Um, but and, and it's tough because they have Alabama coming out of the gate. But I think one, um, you know, they have a lot of players returning from last year, and and uh, you know, then they were they, and they were a good team. They were explosive last year on offense, and I think they'll be good this year. Again, the, the Alabama game is going to tough, and like I said, with um, in terms of um. Who was it? Oh, uh, Georgia. You know, having a game like that out of the gates, it just puts you behind the eight ball. But I, I also think, um, you know, Miami can uh, can can ke- catch up, and as the as the quarterback gets healthier, I think, um, you know, they'll they'll uh, they'll recover nicely from losing Alabama, and uh, and they'll end up uh, in top five. Let's get into our final three teams here. We're going to discuss. We all have them kind of similar, a little bit spread out. Mine are a little different. Dave and Ed have the same top team. Let's go to the the one I have here at two. Ed has at number three, and Dave has at number three, and that's Clemson. Let's get into it, Dave. Tell us a little bit about Clemson here. Well, I, th- I mean, it's, it's splitting hairs. I, th- I think, again, Alabama, Clemson, you know. Um, but the thing is, I, the, they got the quarterback coming back that played a couple games last year. Um, what do what, you call it? Ukulele? Um, yeah. But uh DJ man, DJ. Yeah, DJ, yeah. And you know, and and, and Clemson just reloads. I mean, they they, they uh they're, they're like Ed was saying before their receivers are going to be good. Um and their defense is always top notch. So, so they'll be up there and plus the AC, they always dominate the ACC. So that alone is going to make them at least a top 4 team with you know. And um so I, that's why I I, I think they'll be, they're going to be three only because I think Alabama is a little better and and my number one team is is better too. So that, that's that's one reason why the number three. But again, it, it's close. It's you know, I could 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 Clemson end up being number one? Yeah, absolutely. They def, they're definitely definitely the talent levels there. Ed, let's hear about Clemson. Well, my hope and a lot of people's hope is that their D this year goes from great to special. They definitely have that ability. Everybody's back. Uh, well, they, well, one kid transferred to Georgia. Uh, we'll probably pick on him on September fourth. But uh, he, he's going to be a corner at Georgia in there. But they have everybody back. Uh, their defensive line, Brian Breeze, uh, he's just a stud and he's only a sophomore. Um, so their D is great. The reason I have him three is because there's two people that aren't coming back, and that's Travis and Trevor. And th- they were special. I mean, those were two special players at Clemson. We might not see that transferred to Jacksonville right away, but I think down the line, it definitely will. And yeah, they got guys that are going to replace, replace them, but they're still not, they're not going to be at that level this year. DJ is going to be a great quarterback. Heck, he, he could end up being as good as Trevor Lawrence when he graduates. Some say maybe even better, but coming into this season, I, I not yet, not yet. And I'm a Clemson guy. Everybody who watches that knows it. I'm a Clemson guy, but Replacing Trevor and Travis is not going to be too easy. Uh, that's the only reason that I have him at three is replacing those guys. But um, Lynn J. Dixon, Kobe Pace, the the freshman Will Shipley, they're going to have good running backs, wide receivers. We already went over them when when uh, 
rich throughout Ohio State. I, I named some, and there's some guys I left off that list. I mean, they're deep. They got a good – they got a freshman uh, uh, tight end that's coming in that's going to be very good. And, and the offense coordinator, uh, Tony Elliott, is coaching the tight ends this year. So, I mean, it, by no means is Clemson going away, everybody. They're still there. But I'm, I'm going to be modest and have them at three uh, just because of the loss of those two studs. Yeah, I'm pretty much on board with that. Trevor Lawrence is gone. Travis Etienne has gone. I think they have a culture there. That they're really a juggernaut, a juggernaut here under Dabo Sweeney. They have an immensely talented roster. You guys pretty much covered everything there, talking about Clemson. Uh, now, we have I have this team here sitting at number four, both um, – all right, you know what? Let's go to let's go to this team here. I have them at number one. You guys have them at number two. Let's get into Alabama here. So Alabama to me is you can't leave them off the number one spot as of right now. So they're gonna have a lot of new faces and key roles this year. I still think they're worthy of the top spot in the preseason rankings. Bryce Young takes over for Mac Jones. Brian Robinson's gonna be leading that running back room, trying to replace Najee Harris. They have some good receivers here. John Mechie, he was big after Jalen Waddell's injury last year. And they got Jamison Williams transferred in from Ohio State, who could be an intriguing deep threat for them this year. They have a new offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien, from the Texans. I think they're still going to be very good. And their defense is generally dominant, and I think it's going to be dominant again, returning eight starters. They held Notre Dame and Ohio State to 38 combined points in the college football playoff. They got a, a linebacker transfer in from Tennessee, Henry To'o'o. Um, he should be an immediate contributor trying to replace uh, Dylan Moses. And they returned their eight top tacklers on the team, Christian Harris, Jordan Battle, and Will Anderson among those eight teams. So let's, think, let's get some thoughts here from uh, Dave on Alabama. Yeah, again, another reason why they're um... – I have them two and not one is the quarterback. Um, you know, we, we uh, they have a couple uh, freshmen coming in to play quarterback, but uh, they reloaded at the skill positions with the receiver. You also they mentioned the kid Hall, who was, um, again, I think I mentioned this in the previous podcast, when Alabama announced their recruiting of him to signing, they just said, speed, speed, speed. Um, you know, uh, Nick Saban just brings in these guys who are just like track stars almost. And uh, so they'll be fine. And, um, you know, and defensively, you know, they're, they're going to – they'll be good. And I, I just think, yeah, again, Alabama with Nick Saban, I, I can't see them, you know, a, once in a decade they might not be top two. And uh, this is certainly not the once in a decade. Ed, what do you think? Uh, I have them at two as well. Uh, uh, honestly, I think this year their defense is going to carry them. And uh, everything I'm reading here, and this could be uh, – their best defense they've ever had. And they've had some really good ones. I mean, they're just, they're stacked. That's also part of the reason I probably have them over Clemson uh, at two is just based off of that talent. Even though Clemson has a chance to be special, I think Alabama is, is defense is special already. They have, is, is going to be a solid defense for them. Um, talking about Bryce Young though, that's the guy that kind of questioned me. I mean, I, he, him, him and DJ were the top two quarterbacks coming out in their class. Bryce Young didn't really get to play too much last year. He signed a million-dollar NIL deal with really not seeing the field too much last year. And I'm hearing, and just keep the name down, Jalen Milrow. He's a freshman. Uh, he's already worked his way up. He might even be listed at number two now. Last I saw, he was listed as the number three quarterback. But he ha every report I'm hearing is he's outplayed uh, Bryce Young in camp. So, you know, that's going to be a question now that could be a topic for another time Then we can get to the number one team. But you know what? These kids sign a million-dollar NIL deal. Does it really hurt them if they don't play as a sophomore and they let this freshman start and they, they're still getting their money? They already signed that contract. They already made that deal. So yeah, that's one of the negative effects that NIL could have. But, you know, besides that, Alabama's got a deep wide receiver room. I don't think uh, any of the running backs are going to come close to what they've had in the past. So their offense, I think, is going to struggle. But their defense is is special, and that that should carry them through the th through the tough SEC and get them in the playoff again. Yeah, my my uh, my I'm 
conflicted on what we're going to see here with the NIL. It's going to be very interesting to see. Definitely very interesting to see. So we have our final team we're going to talk about here. Both of you guys, both Ed and Dave, have Oklahoma at number one. I have them at number four. So, Ed, give us your reasons why Oklahoma is your preseason number one team in college football for the 2021 season. Yeah, this time last year I was bashing Spencer Rattler. I wasn't high on Oklahoma. Defense was shaky. Uh, Like I said, I had Iowa State last year. I didn't think Oklahoma was coming out of the Big 12. And for a long time they weren't coming out of the Big 12 until they put it together. But you know what? I have to admit it. I, I, I think this is the year for Oklahoma. I'm starting them at number one over Alabama just based on the offense that they have uh, there and their their improvement on defense. Um, Rattler's back, to, and he's going to lead a team that averaged close to 500 yards a game last year and 43 points a game last year. Uh, the wide rec- receiver core is what I mentioned earlier. I think they have the best wide receivers in the country. I'll just give you three. Mims. Hazelwood and the transfer from Arkansas, Mike Woods, who had, I think he had a thousand yards last year and he might have just under a thousand yards two years ago. So he's coming in. They lost two offensive linemen, but three are coming back. And to replace one of the offensive linemen, they have a transfer, 6'5, 313 pounds, uh, Wanye Morris from Tennessee to step right in at tackle. Plus, in the backfield, they're adding another Tennessee volunteer, Eric Gray, who is a solid stud running back that's going to step right into that Trey Sermon role. Uh, not Trey Sermon actually ended up at Ohio State. He used to be at Oklahoma. Stevenson, he's going to step right into the Stevenson role, Eric Gray. And then, honestly, what everybody questions them on is their defense. Their front seven this year is very, very, very good. They have a very, very good front seven. If the defensive backs can hold up just a little bit, I, I think Oklahoma's going to roll. They I, honestly, I think they should roll until I think it's November, the first week or second week in November. They play Iowa State, but until then, I, I think they they're a solid bet to win everything. Dave, tell us your thoughts on Oklahoma at number one here. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with Oklahoma under Lincoln Riley is offensively they've you know they've been great you know obviously with the heisman quarterbacks and everything but it's always been the defense they've always in big spots have just given up chunks of yards to opposing teams and that and that is the reason why they you know they haven't won a national championship yet under lincoln riley and so this year again with the defense being improved you know they don't have to with, with the offense what they have they don't have to be dominating they just have to be decent you know and, and make a few stops and i think uh you know that, uh, and I think their defense is definitely capable of the improvement they, they're going to show, and I think that's why I think Oklahoma. Um, the one thing I'll tell you too about the receivers is they lost um, Malcolm Bridges, who got kicked off the team for uh, for some kind of. Uh, I think he got arrested for something. So that just goes to show you. I mean, you imagine he was on a team that because he could fly. It's just amazing how the these teams get these re, these receivers. Um, you know, like Alabama and Clemson. Every year, you know, they just seem Ohio State. They always just seem to reload with receivers. Um, but, uh, you know, it's back again, Spencer Rattler, he started off horrible last year. You know, we were all, we were all killing him after he, um, he threw, uh, those interceptions against who was it? Uh, was it Missouri last year? They played, they lost to, or was it Kansas? Kansas state. Mm-hmm. I yeah, think oh, oh, Kansas state. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. After that game, you know, we were all killing him. And then after that, he turned it around and, and he had to hit a hit monster second half. And, you know, so now with all that, with his experience under his belt, I don't see any reason why he had Oklahoma's offense can be you know, almost unstoppable. And so, again, all defense has to do is just show up, you know, at the right time, make some plays. And I think they're going to be better than that. So that's that's kind of dangerous. So that's why I definitely see Oklahoma being number one at the end of the year. And Iowa State, the Iowa State game is, is November 20th. Iowa State, they play November 20th. To me, great and yeah, and th- another big game everybody's talking about, which is just because it's an old rivalry, is they did pick up Nebraska this year to re- to kind of renew that Big Eight rivalry. But quite honestly, I mean, it could be fifty four nothing at halftime. So but those uh, horrible uh, horn corner screen uniforms. Too. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not seeing too much from Nebraska. The 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 reason I'm I don't have Oklahoma here at number one. I'm still giving them their their respect. I got them here at four. Just because they've been there, they're they're a perennial college football playoff team. They've reached it four times. They've won six straight Big Twelve titles. So you got to give them the respect there. I'm just a believer in in Iowa State. I think they have a ton of experience. 
I think they could beat this Oklahoma team on, on November 20th that we just discussed. The reason that Oklahoma or, or the reason that um, Oklahoma has struggled is because of their defense. Uh, they did improve at the end of the season last year under, under defensive coordinator Alex Grinch. If they continue to trend upward, I might move them up these rankings. But right now I'm going to keep them at number four, still giving them the respect to get into the college football play, playoff. But that's just preseason. The whole season's got to shake out. And um, we'll we'll see. It's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun college football year here. So that yeah. was our top. Uh, that was our top ten. Any other thoughts here? Yeah, the way I love, an, an, another thing before we wrap it up, wrap it up. The thing I look at for Oklahoma is if they're going to be national champs, they might as well do it this year. Because if they don't do it this year, and they don't do it next year, then mm-hmm. they go to the SEC. And guess what? Eh, they're just another team when it, and they entered SEC conference. They're not Oklahoma, so what do you say? Six straight Big 12 titles. Realistically, they should end up with eight, but then they're going to go to the SEC, and that'll just be a whole – that's a whole new world, whole new world for them. So if they're going to win it, this is this this is the year to win it because Rattler's leaving, so they might as well win it this year. And um, I just want to say real quick, you know, we're talking about the NIL contracts. We could actually do a whole uh, podcast on that because it's it, it's going to be interesting to see how that affects college football. You know, not not only this this year and going forward, as uh, as I think teams try to navigate and see like what kind of loopholes, because uh, you know every team's looking for an edge. They'll find a loophole to try to uh, lure players to you know to their school. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, with that. Just real quick to add to that, something that you could bring up about it, and I know we got to cut it short, but I mean. You know, these colleges right now, some of the colleges aren't in on the NIL. Like they, they had a, the sample um, D, DJ at Clemson signed with um, he's going to do those Heisman House. Oh, no, not Heisman House. He signed with Dr. Pepper. So the college football Dr. Pepper. But the word is the scene that he shot for those commercials. He's just in a plain orange jersey with number five because they didn't sign an agreement with Clemson. So you can't have the Clemson uniform on. But they're thinking that eventually the college football teams are going to end up looking like the NBA teams, and they're going to take corporate sponsorships. So we'll have advertising on jerseys coming up soon too. That's real, real interesting stuff. Never thought I would see that on a college college football jersey. But uh, everybody, thanks for joining us here for another week of I eighty Sports College Football. If you have any questions for us, you want to hear us talk about something specific, definitely drop a comment on our videos here. We're we're always interested in reading them, and we'll try to get back to everybody. But once again, thanks for joining us here at I-80 Sports College Football. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.